Okay, good morning. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here. I want to take a quick moment to uh, really honor all the volunteers. It's an incredible level of effort to put one of these together, so a huge amount of things go into this. Um, so my name is Nicholas Carey, and uh, it's absolutely perfect that we are here in one of the most famous skyscrapers in the world, surrounded by monuments of capitalism, uh, to discuss the future. And um, just across the river here, actually, in Tower Hamlets, that's the second poorest uh, borough in the entire UK. In the past 12 months, I have traveled nearly 350,000 miles all over the world in search of answering a question about what is the future of money? And I submit to you that the future has arrived, and it's Bitcoin. Um, the photography you'll see in the presentation today was taken on these journeys um, for myself and my family members, and uh, I hope I can kind of share some stories with you today. So let's get started. I'm often asked, what is Bitcoin? So Bitcoin is a payment network, just like the ones we rely on every single day with our credit cards and debit cards. And it's also a currency, like euros or yen. But that's basically where the similarities stop. It's not issued by a central bank, and it's 100% digital. So let me tell you a little story. Um, my sister was volunteering in Africa, and I went to visit her uh, to kind of see how the other side lives. And uh, we took a camel trek into the Saharan desert. It was an incredibly special experience. Um, but basically, we hadn't seen anything that even remotely looked like civilization for a while. And uh, we ended up sitting on this dune watching the sunset. Um, the moon was kind of pulling up over the horizon. There were dung beetles moving along. It was absolutely magical. And our Berber guide that was dressed in this stunning blue jalaba uh, was teaching us about his life. He sells polished geodes for a living to give you a sense of how he creates economic value. Um, the whole moment, though, was basically ruined when this guy pulled out his smartphone and answered a call in the middle of the desert. And uh, in that moment, I had an epiphany that maybe that he may not know it yet, but with a couple thousand lines of computer code, he could essentially replace all of the banking needs he has and interact and interface with anyone anywhere in the world. So the song you're about to hear was inspired by a Hollywood producer that plugged in an amplifier into the Bitcoin network and listened to the sound of real transactions happening. So take a moment to imagine a world with completely frictionless payments, a world where you could send value from a fly fishing lodge in southern Patagonia instantly to Hong Kong, basically for free. Imagine a global payments platform with zero barriers to entry that's completely open source that puts the users firmly in control. So let's talk a little bit about the basics of Bitcoin. It's a little bit like email for money, and we all use email every single day of our lives to keep in touch and correspond uh, with our friends and loved ones. If you were to go deep into it, there are a lot of complexities that make that happen. But staying at a high level, the utility of email is something I think we can all respect. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a technology. It's a computer protocol, similar to TCP IP, which is what email relies on. And it's also a gigantic network. It's the world's largest distributed computing project on Earth. If you were to try to recreate the security that manages this, the 500 most powerful supercomputers on the planet wouldn't come close. So Bitcoin is not managed by a government, it's not proprietary, and it's not centrally controlled. So to create a transaction network, you kind of need three things. You need to have a currency, coins, seashells, tokens, and all these things have been tried. You need to have a ledger system to track the ownership changes, and finally, you need to have settlement with a high degree of certainty. And the Bitcoin network possesses all of these things. So it is a global and open payments platform. It is the only payments platform that can go all over the world without companies basically having to lay fiber or manage the transactions. So let's talk a little bit more about how that works. Basically, anyone in the world using a phone or going to a website can create a Bitcoin wallet. And uh, it's a piece of software that completely replaces the need for a banking institution right away. And it's open source. So in order to send value to somebody else, they just need to know an address. So if I wanted to send some money to Stephanie, Stephanie would give me an email address, and I could send it to her. And it's just that simple. When that transaction is made, it is broadcasted 
to this network called the blockchain. It is a massive distributed ledger. So instead of a bank holding access to one database, there's a distributed database all over the world. These are real transactions happening right now. There are tens of thousands of them happening every hour. So let's talk a little bit about the history of Bitcoin because it's one of the more curious components. Um, Bitcoin was conceptualized as a white paper by a developer or some developers. We actually don't know. They did it under a pseudonym. But it's kind of irrelevant because it's open source. The next year, uh, the network launched in 2009. In 2010, some very basic marketplaces formed. And the world's first transaction happened for Bitcoin, where a guy sold two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins, which are now the most expensive pizzas in the history of time. <laughs> Their worth is about 4 million pounds. But at the time, it wasn't worth very much, but apparently it was worth about two pizzas. Um, in 2011, some early companies formed in this space to experiment and play with it. And generally, they were uh, led by cryptographers and computer scientists that found this an interesting thing. In 2012, merchants all over the world started to accept Bitcoin because no matter where they were, they could open up to a global clientele without having to pay fees. And the transactions come through instantly. In 2013, there was a good deal of venture capital investment. They were placing bets. In 2014, those bets turned into votes of confidence. There have been $750 million of venture capital poured into Bitcoin-specific projects, which is faster and more money than poured into the internet in 1993 and 1994. So last year, we saw an incredible amount of growth, and it continues to move very quickly. So let's talk a little bit about the economics of Bitcoin. This is really interesting. Um, Central banks all over the world issue currency. They use, do things like uh, quantitative easing, and they basically make money out of thin air. And they do this for a bunch of reasons. Um, but this creates inflation, and it has other consequences. Bitcoin is not based on that principle at all. We know exactly how many coins will come into circulation, and they're distributed to the people in the network that help participate. So it's a very different system we have today. The network is maintained by volunteers known as miners. And for contributing their computing power and energy, they get rewarded with new coins. Now, you can go buy and sell bitcoins on international currency exchanges, just like you go buy euros or yens. But you can also help secure the network and earn some. So the whole thing is regulated by mathematics. There are no politicians involved. In the next 100 years, there will be roughly 4 trillion units of currency created. And um, most interestingly, this entire system and the technologies behind it are secured by cryptography. So, Let's just take a quick moment and leave this room. And uh, human beings, let's think about this, have invented all kinds of things in our lives. We invented wheels to help us move around. Then we invented shovels to dig holes. And we invented tractors to pave roads. So if we were sitting in a field or maybe laying down in one and thinking about reinventing money, what kind of characteristics or properties would we want that to have for the age of the internet? Well, I submit you would probably want to be able to move that money around anywhere in the world instantly, basically, for free. Most importantly, you'd probably want your money to be counterfeit proof. You would want your money to be fungible and easily divisible and uh, hard to destroy. If it got wet, you wouldn't want it to get uh, clumpy. And uh, maybe you don't want to have pictures of old dead people on it or something like that. It's kind of odd now, I think. <laughs> um, most importantly, you probably would want your money to be scarce. Right? This is why we don't use grains of sand, because there's an unlimited and ever created more supply of them. And so Bitcoin possesses all of these properties. Is it perfect? I don't know the answer to that. But I would say that if you were to try and create a better form of money, Bitcoin would be a very strong step in the right direction. So where are we today? The Bitcoin network processes about 110,000 transactions a day. The whole net worth of the entire cryptocurrency is roughly $3.5 billion. So to put things in perspective, this building is more valuable than blockchain and Bitcoin <laughs> right now. But hang tight. What you're interested in here is the transaction volume that's moving across this network. So every single week, week over week, the number of people that are using Bitcoin to transact with each other grows. And that shows utility. So what? So what? Why are we talking about this? <laughs> Bitcoin is the world's first scarce digital commodity. Um, it is a only payment system with zero counterparty risk, and it allows people to transact with each other instantly anywhere in the world nearly for free. So why is this a big deal, though? Last year, there were $7.7 .7 trillion in credit card transactions, and uh, that cost consumers and merchants hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and that doesn't include the incredible amount of fraud that happened last year, which will continue because credit cards were designed in the 1950s 
when it needed to be able to pull money out of people's credit. Now, that is incredibly risky on the internet when a service gets compromised, all of your money can be stolen. So a few weeks ago, I was in Bryant Park, which looks a little bit like this, in New York City. And um, I was there meeting with one of the wealthiest venture capitalists on Earth. And uh, we were talking about things. And uh, I watched some children throwing quarters into the pond uh, that's in that square. And right behind those children who were making wishes was a homeless man picking up the coins as the children were making dreams and futures. Um, and in that moment, I was sort of astonished again by the juxtaposition of wealth and inequalities. And I have been thinking more and more about this. But uh, United States, about 20.1% of US households are underbanked, and 8.2% are unbanked. And that's just in the US. Globally, there are 2.5 billion people that have no access to financial services whatsoever. Four billion don't have credit cards. So what if the parents of two young Thai children could have access to a financial network that put them on a better playing field than the hedge fund managers that go to work in these impressive buildings every single day. So let's take a moment to reflect quickly on digital efficiencies. They're impacting every aspect of our lives, and I think we sometimes take them for granted. So I like photography, and I used to have to go develop my photography, right? No one who was born today will ever know what that means. <laughs> and Kodak is now gone. I used to have to drive to Blockbuster and waste dead gasoline or dead dinosaurs and gasoline and, and time and hope that the new DVD I wanted would be on release. And um, now, using any device, I can download any song, any movie I want instantly, basically for free. And we know what happened to Blockbuster. Um, I frequently forget my mother's birthday, and uh, that's a risky thing. Um, now I've got a reminder that pops up in my calendar, and I can send her an email wherever I am and uh, avoid some fury, which is always a good thing. So uh, digital DNA is part of our, our blood now. And um, whether we are consuming digital content or creating experiences and sharing them or uh, remembering to send our mother important correspondence, um, it is really uh, time to think that why can't money be digital too? And so let's not have our head stuck in the sand on this. I want to tell you a story about someone I met that uh, really inspired me last year, and I am going to probably butcher it a bit, but um, she really did uh, inspire something incredible, which was, uh, her name's Fertesh. She was born in um, Iran. She had no proof of existence, and she was displaced because of the conflicts. Um, she's returned to Afghanistan to build schools, and she needed to move funding to the volunteers that were trying to help her do this. She's focused on digital literacy, which is uh, for specifically for women. And unfortunately, all of the major remittance programs and all of the banks and all of the services we rely on uh, to get money into other people's hands refuse to work with her or charge up to 50% um, fees just to help uh, get money into the hands of a 501c3 um, company. And so she's moved her entire operations over to Bitcoin and is putting more money to work in the hands of volunteers instantly. So what is Bitcoin? I think of it more as an invitation to participate in a more equal world. Um, I think of it as the most inclusive way for us to participate together um, in a new type of financial order. So the media and, uh, will frequently focus on illicit activities, greed, and speculation, or the price of Bitcoin and what it's doing. Um, but I'm seeing things in a completely different light, and I want to share some additional stories with you. So this guy's name is Francesco, and his wife is Francesca. He was a flight attendant, and she was a hairdresser. And they moved to Bristol um, and started a deli. Um, he doesn't know much about computer science or cryptography, um, and he doesn't really care. He knows that if he accepts Bitcoin and pays his suppliers in Italy in Bitcoin, that he sees deficiencies, and it helps his bottom line. Uh, this was a nightclub in South America, in Santiago, Chile. There's a major network filming this. It's the first transaction happening down there on the Bitcoin network. And uh, you've got an American football game on, a football pitch on, and then the Bitcoin blockchain on the right, showing transactions coming in as people are buying drinks and ordering pizza. This is Christine, who has the firm responsibility of keeping the students at that Sorbonne overly caffeinated all year long. She has a famous sign on her little stand that says, cash only, Bitcoin preferred. No credit cards. And uh, she's from Canton. So all around the world, uh, and university students especially get this, um, there are hundreds of clubs in the cryptocurrency network that have formed globally. And they meet every single week, and they build software, they integrate it into their campuses, and they're transacting with each other. So whether you were born in the first world or the third, 
Whether you're a mother sending uh, money back home to your daughter or a father sending wages across the border to his family, Bitcoin is the most important uh, expression of personal empowerment since the internet itself. That's why some guy that started the most famous software company of all time, that rhymes with Microsoft, called it a technical tour de force. A Federal Reserve economist said it's a remarkable technical and conceptual achievement. So when I think about the future, um, I wanted to imagine a world where it didn't matter what color your skin was, what gender you are, or where you were born. I wanted a world that was inclusive. And for the first time, we now have the ability for everyone to be their own bank. So thank you.